Hello and welcome. Today let's talk about joints. Now here when we go through and we talk about joints, first we'll go through a little bit of introduction and then we'll jump full on into the different classifications then of joints. Now first here, a joint is also known as an articulation as we can see here. Now it's a point where two bones meet. A point where two bones meet. That's a joint, that's an articulation. Now the term arthrology, arthrology is a study of joint structure, function, and dysfunction as well. Okay, then the term biomechanics. Now biomechanics is a study of movements and mechanisms in body. Also kinesiology there is a sub kind of uh, study there, and that's a study of musculoskeletal movement. A lot of students usually get into kinesiology, uh, the major kinesiology, and uh, go on and uh, uh, work with uh, athletes and, uh, you know, other things that you could do there as well. <clears throat> now, here when we go through and we talk about our joints, our joints, uh, I want you guys to know, are going to be the weakest part of our skeleton. Nonetheless, they can resist various forces. So our joints are the weakest part of the skeleton. Nonetheless, they can resist various forces such as crushing forces or tearing forces that threaten to force them out of alignment. Now, when we define joints, again, we said this is where two bones come to meet. And the function of our joints are to give our skeleton mobility. Number one, to give our skeleton mobility. And then number two, to help hold it together. Now, when we go through and we classify our joints, our joints are going to be classified by structure and also you'll see by function. So they get classified a couple of different ways, by structure and by function. Now, when we go through and we talk about our joints, we'll see our joints are going to be classified again by structure and function. So when we look at, their, when we look at the functional classification then, we'll see we have basically three different classifications there and this functional classification is going to be based on the amount of movement that's allowed at the joint. So here then we first classify our joints as being synarthroses joints which are immovable joints and they're going to be found in relation to the axial skeleton. Second, then we have our amphiarthroses joints. Our amphiarthroses joints are slightly movable joints, also found in relation to the axial skeleton. And then third type are our diarthroses joints. Our diarthroses joints now are going to be freely movable joints, freely movable joints. And they're going to predominate, they will predominate in the limbs they will predominate in the limbs, diarthrosis joints. And the other two, we said axial skeleton. Next then we have the classification based off of structure. Now when we, talk about, uh, when we talk about classifying them based off of structure, this classification is going to focus on the material that's going to be binding the bones together. And also whether or not there is a joint cavity present. So the first, type of ca uh, the first type of joints that we'll have here are going to be our fibrous joints. Our fibrous joints. And our fibrous joints are going to be immovable joints. And examples will include sutures. And we'll check those out. The tibia fibula joint. The tibia fibula joint, we'll see the distal tib fib joint. Uh, we have a ligament there and we'll check that out. That's going to help uh, construct this fibrous joint. And then also our tooth with the bony alveolus. Second type then will be cartilaginous joints. Cartilaginous joints. Now, cartilaginous joints, we'll see they can be rigid or slightly movable joints. For example, our nose will be one. We'll check out there. And then we have synovial joints. Synovial joints are going to be freely movable joints. <clears throat> For example, the knee, shoulder, 
Okay, elbow. So let's go through and let's check out our fibrous joints. Now when we look at and we check out our fibrous joints, we can see our fibrous joints are going to be joints where the bones are going to be joined by dense fibrous connective tissue. And no joint cavity will be present. One example will be our sutures. Our sutures, they're interlocking wavy articulating bone edges and they're filled with short connective tissue fibers. They're filled and we'll check that out. Now when we define our sutures they can be defined as basically seams that are only going to be found occurring between the bones of the skull. So examples will include the sutures found in between the bones of the skull. Now here we can check those out. And we can see now when we go through and we talk sutures, we have three different types, serrate, lap, and plane. Here we can see when we talk coronal, okay, serrate suture. And then we move down, we've talked about the squamous suture, a little bit more of a lap suture. And then here we could see we've got a plane suture in between the two maxillae. And then eventually we've got a couple of other bones back here. Same thing we're able to appreciate here. Dense fibrous connective tissue. Again, filling all these open regions in here filling them all up. Next in here we can see we've got our next classification which will be then our syndesmosis joints. Now when we talk about our syndesmosis joints, syndesmosis joints are going to be joints, so you can define them as joints where the bones are connected exclusively by ligaments cords of connective tissue or bands of connective tissue. And examples you can see here the interosseous membrane, fibrous connective tissue, and then here that distal tib fib joint protected by this ligament of connective tissue here. Next then our gomphoses joints, our gomphoses joints. These are a defined like a, they're defined as a peg in a socket fibrous joint. Peg in a socket fibrous joint. So the tooth to the socket, and they're held in place now. Tooth's held in place by the periodontal ligament. Slight movement, okay, Slight movement under stress of chewing. <clears throat> Next in here we've got another nice picture depicting that, periodontal ligament, helping to keep the tooth in place. So all three we could see there very nicely. Next then let's move. Let's move to our um, cartilaginous joints, our cartilaginous joints. Now when we talk cartilaginous joints, our cartilaginous joints are going to be basically joints where the articulating bones are united by cartilage. They also lack a joint cavity and are not highly movable joints. The first type we'll see here are synchondroses joints. They're described as being a, a joint where you have a junction of cartilage. So when we define these synchondroses joints, 
synchondrosis joints are going to be defined as joints where you have a bar or a plate of hyaline cartilage. Where you have a bar or a plate of hyaline cartilage that unites bones. Synchondrosis joints are synarthrotic joints. Synchondrosis joints are defined as joints where a bar or a plate of hyaline cartilage unites the bones. Synchondrosis joints are synarthrotic. Now, examples will include the epiphyseal plates in our long bones, our hyaline cartilage is the type of uh, cartilage we'll see there, Synchondrosis joints are joints that are going to be defined as a joint where a bar or a plate of hyaline cartilage unites the bones. So when we talk about synchondrosis joints, synchondrosis joints are going to be synarthrotic. Now examples will include the epiphyseal plate in our long bones. And the joint we're going to see, we're going to have between the first rib and the manubrium. So here we can see that very well. <clears throat> Hyaline cartilage uniting the bones. And the same thing here as well. Next type then is going to be our symphysis joints. These are amphiarthrotic joints. Now they're going to be described uh, or defined as basically joints where the articular surfaces of the bones are covered with articular or hyaline cartilage, <coughs> which in turn then is fused, which in turn then is fused to an intervening pad to an intervening pad or a plate of fibrocartilage, which is the main connecting material then. Fibrocartilage is compressible and a resilient shock absorber. And it allows limited movement, limited movement. An example will be the intervertebral discs and then also our pubic symphysis. Next then we have our synovial joints. Now when we talk about our synovial joints, these are joints where the articulating bones are separated by a fluid containing joint cavity. Now, there's six distinguishing features here that we're going to go through and we're going to check out. So these joints are diarthroses or diarthrodial joints, varied mobility. Some are freely movable to some being very limited to mobility, limited in, in mobility. They're, most, they're the most structurally complex joints. You'll see that when we go through the six distinguishing features. And also they're the most likely to develop dysfunctions. So let's go through the six distinguishing features. Now I want you to go through them and read through them more thoroughly and get a better idea when you read through the text and uh, be able to you know, understand what you have going on there. So here's a couple of them and then here we can see the others and here we can actually see them. Here you can actually see them as well. So the bursae we can see there as well. We'll go through, we'll check this all out. So 
Here first, when we go through and we talk about our six uh, distinguishing features, first distinguishing feature I'd like you to know about is the articular cartilage. Now this articular cartilage is a glassy, smooth, hyaline cartilage. And it's found covering the opposing bone surfaces. It's found covering the opposing bone surfaces. And it absorbs compression and keeps the bone ends from being crushed. It absorbs compression and keeps the bone ends from being crushed. Next thing we have, the, next thing we have the joint cavity. The joint cavity is a potential space. And there's a potential space that contains a small amount of synovial fluid. Now here, when we go through and we talk about this, uh, this uh, basically joint cavity, this joint cavity is a part of the joint uh, capsule, as we can see. Now the joint capsule also includes now the articular capsule, which we'll see is going to be uh, a two-layered capsule. So it's a two-layered capsule that the joint cavity is enclosed by. Now the first layer is going to be the fibrous capsule. So let's move right over to here, and we can appreciate those structures. So here we start off with the hyaline cartilage, okay, then the actual joint cavity, and now here we can see the two different layers out here. So first we're going to have the fibrous capsule. The fibrous capsule is the more external layer, and it's tough. It's composed of dense, irregular connective tissue. It's also going to be continuous with the periostea. It's continuous with the periostea of each of these articulating bones. So you can see that there very nicely. The next layer then is going to be the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane you see here kind of in light green is the inner layer and it's composed of loose connective tissue. It's composed of loose connective tissue. Next then is the synovial fluid. The synovial fluid. Now when we talk about the synovial fluid, we'll see the synovial fluid is going to be a slippery fluid. It's like a lubricant. And it's going to occupy all of this free space within this joint cavity. It will occupy all of the free space within that capsule. Next then are going to be the reinforcing ligaments. Now when we talk about the reinforcing ligaments, these reinforcing ligaments are band-like ligaments. And they're going to be basically the thickened part of this fibrous capsule. They will be a thickened part of this fibrous capsule. Next then are the articular discs. The articular discs are going to be discs or wedges of fibril cartilage that's going to be found separating the articulating surfaces. So let's talk about synovial joint movements. Let's talk about synovial joint movements. Now when we talk about synovial joint movements, I want you guys to know first that every skeletal muscle is attached to bone or other connective tissue structures at two points. The first point is going to be known as the origin. And the origin is usually attached to an immovable bone. The origin of a muscle, that skeletal muscle is, when it's attached to the origin, that origin is to an immovable bone. Now the second point of attachment is going to be the insertion. Now the insertion is attached to a movable bone or a movable bone piece. Now when you talk about synovial joint movements, 
movement then you'll see is going to occur when muscles contract. Now when muscles contract, they shorten. So when muscles contract or when muscles shorten across our joints and their insertion moves closer to the origin, that's when you have these movements. So when we go through and we talk about movements, we're going to see we have various types of movements. The first types of movements we're going to check out are gliding movements. Now, gliding movements are defined as the simplest joint movements. And these are movements where you have one flat or nearly flat bone surface, glides or slips past, Another, when one flat or nearly flat bone surface glides or slips, glides or slides past another without appreciable angulation or rotation. Now, one example is going to be the intracarpal joints we can see here. The intratarsal joints, another, we have there as well. Next then are going to be angular movements. When we talk about angular movements, angular movements are going to be movements where we are going to have appreciable angulation now. These movements will include flexion, extension, and hyperextension. So let's go through and let's see when we talk about these types of movements, these angular movements, these again are going to be movements that are going to be defined as movements that can increase or decrease the angle between two bones. These are movements that can increase or decrease the angle between two bones. Now, the first type of movement we'll check out here is flexion. When we talk about flexion, flexion is a type of bending movement. It's a type of bending movement that decreases the angle of a joint. For example, bending the head forward to where you allow the chin to basically come in and touch or get close to the chest. That's going to be a type of flexion. So a flexion is a movement, it's a bending movement that decreases the angle of the joint. That decreases the angle of the joint. So you see here that angle is decreasing now. It's less here versus what we had here in the plane, from our anatomical plane. Now extension, extension would be a movement that increases the angle, that increases the angle. Here it would be basically straightening that flexed neck, straightening that flexed neck. So going back to the anatomical position then. Now, hyperextension, hyperextension is going to be basically an excessive extension, an excessive extension, and it increases the angle. Now, some joints may be, may be able to exhibit hyperextension, others may not, could cause injury to them. So here you could see the young lady is taking her head even further back, allowing for the angulation to increase even more and then having a hyperextension. Here we can see the young lady is doing the same thing with the lower limb and then also here with the upper limb, flexion and an extension of that upper limb at the joint, at basically the shoulder joint. And then here we could see flexion and extension of the leg at the knee. Flexion, extension and hyperflexion, we could see here extension and hyperextension of that vertebral column.
Next in here, flexion and extension we can see right here in relation to that upper limb at the elbow. And then here we can see at the wrist. Here we've got at the hip. Okay, and we saw the same thing here at the shoulder. Next thing we have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot. Dorsiflexion and plantar flexion of the foot. And I want you to understand the opposite there as well, dorsi extension and plantar extension. So here when we go through and we talk about dorsiflexion and plantar extension of the foot, these are up and down movements of the foot at the ankle joint. Now when we talk dorsiflexion, dorsiflexion you can see is an upward movement where the toes are going to move closer to the leg. And you flex the dorsum of the foot. You flex the dorsal aspect of the foot. Now, plantar flexion is the opposite. It's depressing the foot. You're flexing the plantar aspect of the foot. So at the same time, you're extending the dorsum. So while here you're flexing the dorsum, you're extending the plantar aspect. Next thing we have, ab duction and adduction abduction and adduction are going to be basically movements that move the limbs away from or closer to the midline of the body abduction and adduction are movements that are going to move Parts of the body away from or towards the midline. So here we could see this young lady, when she moves her arms away, and their arms are moving, you can see here, up above her head, we have an abduction. I mean, we hear of this commonly, unfortunately, in the news where people are abducted. Here you could see those arms are being abducted, basically, from the midline of the body. Now, opposite, when she brings them back, here you can see adduction. So even in the hospitals, you'll use uh, the first two letters to uh, specify what you're talking about sometimes as well, just because they both sound the same. So you'll say abduction or adduction to make sure the person understands. Sometimes you may have to have a certain component abducted or adducted and whatever you may have there. Next thing we have the term circumduction. Now when we talk circumduction, circumduction is uh, it's basically where you're moving a limb so it describes a cone in space. Moving a limb so it describes a cone in space. Now it's defined as a movement that involves abduction, adduction, extension, and flexion. So again, when we talk circumduction, circumduction involves abduction, adduction, extension, and flexion. It'll involve all these other movements we see here. Now, when we go through and we talk about circumduction, circumduction, I'd like you to know, is uh, an example of circumduction would be where basically a pitcher is winding their arm and kind of warming up, you could think of, or uh, even um, uh, quarterbacks as well. So where you see a pitcher winding up to throw a ball or a quarterback winding up to throw a football. And it's an easy way to work. You'll see a lot of different muscles all at once. So a type of movement where you describe a cone in space. Now we say cone in space because if you see when we're exhibiting this type of movement, the hand is exhibiting a wider movement along the plane. <coughs> Excuse me. Versus the shoulder. The shoulder is basically staying... Uh, put, not fully stationary, but you see more of that uh, uh, kind of uh, the widening out kind of part happening that way. Next thing we have rotation. Now next when we talk rotation, rotation is basically uh, turning of a bone around its own long axis. Hip we can see, 
shoulder we can have there, the neck we can have rotation here as well, we could see. So lateral rotation, a type of medial rotation you can think of as well. Now other or special movements, now when we talk about other or special movements, they're going to include number one, we see supination. When we talk supination, supination uh, is going to be a type of movement where we'll see the radius and the ulna are going to be found lying parallel to each other. And the palm is facing anteriorly, where the palm is facing anteriorly. Here the hand is in a supinated position. Now in pronation, what happens is you can see the radius crosses the ulna, and the palm now faces posteriorly. Palm is facing posteriorly. One way to remember, give me soup, soup. I can hold the soup. Or pronation, basketball pros dribble the basketball like this. So pronation. Next thing here we've got, you can see another image depicting both of them, both in one. Then we've got inversion and eversion. Now, inversion and eversion are special movements of the foot. Inversion is where the sole of the foot turns medially, where you have the sole of the foot turning medially, and then eversion, where the sole of the foot moves laterally. So inversion and eversion are going to be special movements of the foot. Inversion is a movement where you could see you have the sole of the foot facing medially, and eversion, where you have the sole of the foot facing laterally, facing laterally. Next terms are protraction and retraction. Protraction and retraction are non-angular, anterior and posterior movements. Non-angular, anterior and posterior movements. They're basically movements along the transverse plane. For example, we can see the shoulders here. The young man is protracting and then retracting the shoulders. And same thing here with the jaw. The young lady is exhibiting protraction and then pulling back, retraction. Next then we have elevation and depression. Elevation and depression. Elevation is the raising of a body part. Depression then is lowering of the body part. So here the young man is elevating and depressing his shoulders. Next term then is opposition. Opposition. Opposition is uh, thanks to the saddle joint we have between metacarpal 1 and the trapezium. Now when you touch your thumb to the tips of the fingers of the same hand, now, when you touch your fingers with the same hand you're exhibiting, when you touch your thumb with these, uh, with this index finger, these other fingers, you're exhibiting that opposition movement there. So opposition we have here. Now, opposition makes the human hand a fine tool for grasping and manipulating. Next, then let's check out uh, and let's talk about the range of motion of synovial joints. And then here you can see, uh, before we jump into that, um, some more specific uh, movements here in relation to the fingers, abduction, and then adduction you can exhibit there, opposition of the thumb as we've mentioned, and then here ulnar flexion, radial flexion, and then uh, go through basically each of these, excursion, lateral medial excursion, and the protraction retraction we talked about there, and check out every single one of these there as well. So this will then take us to the next section. The next section is going to take us into the range of motion of synovial joints, and when we talk about the range of motion in relation to synovial joints, here we're going to be able to go through and we're going to be able to check out basically the range of motion there. Now, first I want you to know some of our joints are going to exhibit non-axial movement. Now, when they're exhibiting non-axial movement, these will be joints uh, such as uh, uh, these intra intercarpal joints that we have that are going to exhibit just gliding or slipping types of movements as we described before. And then we also have joints that will exhibit uniaxial movement. And now when these joints exhibit uniaxial movement, they're going to just have movement along one plane of axes. Next then we're going to have, we'll see 
biaxial moving joints, and we talk about biaxial moving joints, biaxial moving joints are going to be joints that exhibit movement along two planes of space. Right? These are planes of space that we talked about in chapter one. And then multi-axial movement. Multi-axial movement, they're going to exhibit movement in or around all three planes of space or axes. So if you don't recall them, you've got to go back and review chapter one. Next thing, let's talk about the different types of synovial joints. So let's go through and let's check each of these joints out then in greater detail. Now first here, when we go through and we talk about the different types of synovial joints, you'll see they may have the same structural features. However, the structural plan is going to be different. So first we'll talk about and we'll check out plane joints. When we talk about and we check out plane joints, these are going to be non-axial joints. And these are joints where you have a flat articular surface of one bone that will glide or slide past another flat articular bone surface. So the intercarpal and intertarsal joints and also our intervertebral joints. Our intervertebral joints then sometimes get described as being um, biaxial. Next thing we have our hinge joints, and we talk about our hinge joints. Our hinge joints exhibit uniaxial movement, and our hinge joints are joints where you have the cylindrical end of one bone that conforms to a trough-shaped surface of the other bone. Example is the elbow. You can see here the ulna and the trochlea of that humerus. And then also our interphalangeal joints. Our interphalangeal joints. Right, just being able to do this. Next then we have our uh, pivot joints. Our pivot joints. Our pivot joints exhibit uniaxial movement. And our pivot joints, you'll see these are joints where you have the rounded end of one bone it conforms to a sleeve or a ring composed bone or ligament. This is one example here. We see the proximal radial ulnar joint. Also, we've got C1 and C2, the dens. Same thing happening there. Next, then we have our condyloid joints. We talk about our condyloid joints. These are ellipsoidal joints. These are joints that exhibit biaxial movement. Here it's important you understand both articulating surfaces are oval. Both articulating surfaces are oval. So you can define these joints as being joints where you have the oval articular surface of one bone. And it fits into a complementary depression of another bone. And we see that here very well at our metacarpal phalangeal joints. Next then are our saddle joints, our saddle joints. We talk about our saddle joints. They exhibit biaxial movement. Here you'll see each articular surface, each articular surface has both concave and convex regions to it. Each Articulating bone surface has both concave and convex areas to it. And it's shaped like a saddle, this joint is. Hence the name. Our carpal, metacarpal joint of the thumb, right, allowing us to twiddle our thumbs. Saddle joint. And then last, we have our ball and socket joints. We talk about our ball and socket joints. They exhibit multi-axial movement. And our ball and socket joints are joints where you have the spherical or hemispherical head of one bone that articulates with a cup-like socket of another bone. Shoulder and hip, we've seen both of them. Let's actually go through and let's talk about our major synovial joints. And the first major synovial joint that we'll look at and we'll talk about will be our 
jaw joint or our temporal mandibular joint. Oh, it's also known as. This joint is going to be found located anterior to the ear. It's located anterior to the ear. And the bones involved here include the mandible, more specifically speaking, the mandibular condyle. The mandibular condyle articulates with the mandibular fossa on the inferior surface of the squamous region of the temporal bone. Now when you describe this joint, temporal mandibular joint is described as a joint where you have an egg-shaped condyle of one bone fitting into a depression of another bone. Here we also have, you can see the articular capsule, and then the, um, the thickening of the capsule we can see here is basically the uh, lateral ligament, which is going to be uh, one of our reinforcing ligaments. So when we talk about our reinforcing ligament, this is going to be the lateral ligament here, I'd like you to know about. And it's a thickened part of the articular capsule, and it's functioning to help enclose the joint. Next then we have our glenohumeral joint or our shoulder joint. Nice image here. Here the bones involved are going to include the humerus and the scapula and then get more specific so you know the exact spots of each of those bones because it's very generically speaking. Next then we have a description. This, uh, this uh, joint is going to be described as a ball and socket joint where the stability has been sacrificed to provide one of the most freely moving joints. Reinforcing ligaments here that I'd like you to know about are going to include the glenohumeral ligaments. You can see the glenohumeral ligaments are helping to reinforce the articular capsule. And these ligaments are basically three ligaments that strengthen the front of the capsule. And these ligaments can be weak and even absent in a lot of individuals. Again, uh, uh, just anatomical variability. Next then we have the coracoacromial ligament. <clears throat> Excuse me, coracoacromial ligament. So here you can see coracoid process to acromia, coracoacromial ligament. Helping to stabilize and provide strength to the top of that joint. Next then we have the coracohumeral ligament. The coracohumeral ligament is superiorly located and it gives strong thickening to the capsule and it helps to support the weight of the upper limb. It helps to support the weight of the upper limb. And here you can see the biceps uh, brachii tendon making its way down. Another nice view here, lateral view. And this will take us then down to the elbow joint. Then we talk elbow joint, a couple of nice pictures there. Here we can see the elbow joint. The bones involved will include the radius, the ulna, and the humerus. This is a stable and smoothly operating hinge joint that allows flexion and extension. So it's described as being a stable and smoothly operating hinge joint that allows flexion and extension. There's some reinforcing ligaments here I'd like you to know about. The first one that we can see is uh, uh, outside of that, or first we can see here the articular capsule, and the first one we can see outside of the articular capsule then is going to be the annular ligament. Here we can see the annular ligament. Here on this side, you can't appreciate it that well because here is where it's blending into this uh, radial collateral you can see. But if we switch around, move to the other side, here you can appreciate that annular ligament in greater detail. It surrounds the head of the radius. And then we can appreciate the radial collateral as we can see here very nicely. It's a triangular ligament on the lateral side of that elbow. And then we have our ulnar collateral ligament. Triangular shaped ligament on the medial side now, on the medial side. Elbow joint. 
Don't confuse this. A lot of students in class, in class, after I've lectured about it, I ask them, what joint is this? They call this the shoulder, the uh, knee, and all this other stuff, but uh, it's the elbow joint. I don't know. You've got to understand that. And then here we can, we can understand, we can see basically where the head of the radius pops out of that annular ligament. This is quite common in kids uh, when adults or somebody who's trying to pick them up picks them up the wrong way, as we say in layman's terms, and they pull that head of the radius out. And then so we have to go back in and uh, replace it back into the ligament. <clears throat> next thing we have the hip joint, coxal joint. We talk hip joint, the bones involved. So next let's talk about Next, let's talk about the hip joint, the coxal joint. When we talk about the hip joint, the coxal joint, the bones involved will include the femur and the acetabulum of the coxal bone. Right? You got to get specific, the head and then the acetabulum. This is a ball and socket joint that has good range of motion, however, not as wide as the shoulders. It has good range of motion, not as wide as the shoulders. There are some reinforcing ligaments here that I'd like you to know about as well. And they'll include, number one, the iliofemoral ligament. We talk iliofemoral ligament. It's a strong V-shaped ligament anteriorly located on the hip joint. Then we have the ischiofemoral ligament. The ischiofemoral ligament, the ischiofemoral ligament, you'll see is a spiraling ligament. It's spiraling from the posterior aspect towards the anterior aspect. And then last, we have the pubofemoral ligament. Pubofemoral. A nice triangular thickening of the capsule. So that's all of the ligaments out here. Now we've got to move to the inside. Now when we move to the inside, we have ligamentum teres. So in order to appreciate ligamentum teres, we'll move to this view here. Here you can actually see ligamentum teres that we've talked about. We've talked about how it makes its way from that fovea capitis down to the lower lip of the acetabulum to help secure that femur in place. And that's what you're seeing right inside of there. You can see it right in here. And the beautiful labrum, and this will fit right on top of there. Next, let's talk about the knee joint. Knee joint. Now, when we talk about the knee joint, the knee joint is uh, uh, going to involve the femur, the patella, and the tibia. And this is the most, uh, uh, this is the largest and the most complex joint. It's one of the most complex joints. It's the largest and the most complex joint of the body. There are some reinforcing ligaments here as well you need to know about. They will include, number one, the patellar ligament. So let's move out here. Here you can see, first you've got the quadriceps tendon making its way around. And then here you can see that you've got the patellar ligament. So it runs from the patella to the tibia below. Next in here, we're going to be able to appreciate the fibular and the, uh, fibular and the tibial collateral ligaments. Fibular collateral and tibial collateral ligaments. You can see here they are extra capsular ligaments. And they prevent lateral and medial rotation when the knee is extended. Next then is the ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament we can see here, and then we'll talk posterior cruciate back there. Now we talk ACL. The ACL attaches from this anterior intercondylar eminence area of the tibia, and it passes posteriorly, laterally, and upwards, and it attaches to the medial side of the lateral condyle. And this ACL, the anterior cruciate ligament, it prevents forward sliding of the tibia. It prevents forward sliding of the tibia. And then the PCL we could see here, it comes from the posterior intercondylar area, passes anteriorly, medially, and superiorly to attach to the femur on the lateral side of the medial condyle. And then we can also appreciate here 
the lateral meniscus and the medial meniscus. And they're very important when it comes to injuries. When we have any type of a lateral clipping, okay, or a, uh, this type of a motion they're showing here with the foot fixed, what this does, it leads to this unhappy triad where you have three consecutive events that usually take place. One, that tibial collateral tears, the medial meniscus tears, and the ACL tears. A few people are like Adrian Peterson, but most uh, of the time, this is a season-ending, or forget season-ending, a career-ending injury, the ACL tear. So, very good.